glad to be here. It's my first NGINX conference, so I'm happy to, to be here to speak about uh, what we have been doing in terms of building our own uh, API management platform uh, inside of Adobe. Uh, during, when, in Sarah's introduction, she mentioned Adobe.io, and I want to just sort of explain that that not only represents the domain name that we use to expose APIs, but it's actually become a brand name internally for us. Uh, people, uh, when we work across all the different BUs and product teams within Adobe, they don't think of us as to what organization we belong to. They just think of us as the Adobe.io team, which actually sometimes is really helpful in terms of breaking down organizational boundaries. But so talking about what we do, though, when I tried to, I was trying to explain perhaps to my family, but like, what is it that we actually do in this API platform thing, and what does it mean to customers? And I thought that the, it was always hard for me to explain that sometimes. I thought, well, maybe I should turn it around and think of it from the perspective of a user or a customer of Adobe that's using maybe one of our applications and how we actually help enable that, that particular experience. So, so with that, I have a short video. So maybe if we could actually play the video quickly. It's about a minute and a half. And hopefully that'll sort of set the stage for the rest of my talk. Hi, today I want to show you a very cool feature of the Photoshop Mix application called Content Aware Field. With it, you can remove items from your picture that you don't want, and you can let the cloud, the creative cloud, figure out how to fill the empty space with and what to put in as a replacement. To get started, I'm going to click on the plus button on the left of my iPad, and I'm going to select the image that I want to edit. Photoshop Mix is going to create automatically a new project for me. So, I have this picture and taking is beautiful. Let's say I don't want to have the persons in the pool in this image um, and I want to remove some of the background items. To get moving, I'm going to click on the more edits button on the bottom right and I'm going to select content aware fill. Once this is selected, I can go and just drag with my finger an area in the image where I want the content aware to fill and make some items disappear. When ready, we're going to click on the checkbox on the bottom right. What's happening is that right now Photoshop Mix is uploading the picture in the cloud. The cloud is uploading the content aware fill and when the image comes back, wow! The person is gone. Isn't that amazing? So my point in showing that video was not to show Photoshop Mix per se, but to show that when you saw it rendering or uploading to the cloud, rendering the image and coming back to the user, those are actually API calls that are exposed and managed through our API gateway. So, so that was perhaps one way I could sort of say that's the value that we in the platform enable to, to our product teams internally is we enable that experience. And we do that in a consistent way across all of the clouds within Adobe. So if anybody, if you're familiar with Adobe, you might actually think of us actually as being three large clouds. A creative cloud, which is what you just saw the interaction with, document cloud and marketing cloud. These are actually today within Adobe or, or have been three totally separate clouds. And each one of them might have had some of their own APIs. Uh, and therefore, they might have had their own ways to secure those APIs, logging, analytics, et cetera. And they did that all in their own way. So they, there was no consistent way of doing it across Adobe. Uh, it might, in some cases, the features were rich. In other cases, the features were absent. So what we realized that as we started, not only four years ago when we started down the path of becoming a software as a service provider, about two years or so ago, we actually started on the path of doing API-first development. So how could we manage APIs across all of these clouds, and especially for customers that might actually have purchased solutions across each of these clouds? We wanted to be able to provide them a consistent experience by which they could interact with us and use those APIs. And for product teams, we wanted to be able to give them value in terms of taking some workload off of them and also provide them a rich set of analytics around what, um, what, uh, how, uh, how their APIs are being used in the real production world. So that's where Adobe.io came in. So about two years ago, uh, we started doing, this, doing development of the platform uh, and is now uh, being positioned as the single or the unifying experience from an API management perspective across each of the clouds. 
Of course, we are in a different, uh, different stages of, of uh, adoption with each of those clouds, and I have an interesting slide to talk about on that. But so now we have a, we're working toward this idea that Adobe.ai will consistently manage these APIs across all of Adobe. So what does that mean? So what are, when we looked at what we needed to be able to offer to customers, as in Adobe customers, we, and to as well as API service publishers, the teams inside of Adobe that publish APIs, we said, well, we want to make sure we enable protection. And the protection has a number, of, uh, a number of attributes underneath that. We want it to be able to continue to support the rapid time to market for our product teams as they bring new, new features out into the market really quickly, including doing things like pre-release testing. We want it to have a single unified experience or customer-facing experiences for our customers where they could come learn about our APIs and SDKs, be able to download documentation, be able to request API keys to be able to consume the APIs. And then for our product teams, we wanted to make sure that they had a, a, a rich set of uh, data for analytics perspective so they could learn how their APIs are being consumed. And because a lot of times I think when, just like uh, sometimes we forget about security first in doing our application designs, we also forget about how to capture the data that we need to say, how are the, how do the, how are the APIs actually being used? So we tried to offer those as value statements around, around what we do in the platform, not just about being a web proxy layer per se. So if you look at the capability uh, circle there on the, on the, at least my left, I guess we on the left side of the screen. So let's talk, let's talk really at a high level there on each of those little bullet items. So security, so this again brings out a number set of features. It's everything from the fact we implement the embargoed country lists so that we'll block you know, requests from IP addresses that are coming from countries that are on that list to the idea that we do token validations before the service actually gets invoked. So if somebody's trying to pass an invalid token to us, that gets stopped by us at the gateway layer and doesn't have to actually get all the way to the back end service for processing and for them to detect it. So, so this takes a little bit of work off of the, the back end teams that they know when they get that access token, it's a valid token. And then they just then they have to take whatever action they need, perhaps looking at scopes or something like that inside that token. Traffic management is actually one of the areas that I think has become incredibly important uh, for what the gateway does. So this actually means a number of things. And I have an architecture slide I'm going to drill down to a little bit further on. But at the highest level, it means both a how do we handle routing in front of the gateway. In other words, are we looking at a latency-based or GOIP-based kind of routing model, or perhaps even a direct routing model? But behind the gateway as well is that services sometimes are not uniformly distributed across all the locations at Adobe. So sometimes we need to be able to dynamically uh, determine, is that API service available at what locations? And then even in some cases, the customer's data that needs to be, that, that that service needs to act upon might only exist in one or two locations, and we need to make a specific decision how to route to that service at that right location. So there's a lot of uh, dynamics, if you wish, or a lot of different uh, variables that we have to consider when we do even the routing behind the gateway itself. Anomaly detection is something that is actually, we just started doing this summer, uh, starting to develop on it. It's, it's the idea that now that we've been in production for about 15 months, people are coming to us and asking, well, What's an anomalous situation? What is it, what's, what's, what's a strange looking traffic look like? So we started a machine learning ex, uh, uh, exercise over this past summer where we've actually started to start to look at data. So we can actually now in real time actually start to infer information about the traffic coming in. So this isn't just looking at, you know, okay, over the last month or the last year, here's what my patterns were. We're actually looking at it more as terms of real time so that somebody within the minute can say, you know something, I just had an unusual spike in something. Maybe it's a response code to a certain type of token invalidation or something. Maybe that's indicative of attack, or maybe it's just an indicative of something happened. So we're trying to uh, become much more um, proactive in terms of being able to inform uh, our customers, our product teams, what's going on and is there something we should be looking at. So versioning, developer portal, API documentation, this is all around how do we provide a great experience to our customers, people who are coming to, to our portals to be able to say, hey, I want to find out about the APIs that Adobe's offering. I want to learn how to consume them. I want to be able to, enable to uh, be enabled to consume them by getting an API key and a secret and begin to, to consume them. Analytics, again, we, I have a, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we also break analytics down into two, into two groups. One is the product usage analytics that maybe a product manager for a team might be interested in. Who's using my APIs? Where are they coming from? Uh, what applications are our most common, uh, most common callers of APIs, but also to the product teams themselves, we give them a fairly rich set of operational analytics 
How many, how many response codes, 403 response codes are you getting? Where are they coming from? What's your network bandwidth utilization looking like uh, for your APIs? Because we perhaps have a, a rather uh, diverse set of APIs. Uh, because we're dealing, for example, with Creative Cloud, and, and, and we get large content sizes, so it's not unusual for us to get a file upload of a couple of gigabytes, which probably isn't a typical payload you might see. And then we just have, then we have the more common ones where you have very small payloads. Uh, global deployment was also key for us. So today, we're, we're an all Amazon-based uh, deployment today. Uh, we're in five, Amaz five different Amazon regions today, so we can basically take traffic on, at closer to the edge from our customer's perspective and also support a diverse uh, location of uh, where all the backend APIs are. So those were all of the things we sort of looked at and say, what is it that we're offering in terms of capabilities in the platform at a really high level? So the next thing I wanted to talk about was adoption. So we went live with the platform roughly 15 months ago, and we've been kind of watching it ever since. And so thankfully, actually, it, it's the, the perfect curve, I guess, or the direction we wanted to go is up and to the right. So if you started out in June of 2014 with the Creative SDK launch, which was the first large SDK that we launched that enabled third parties to be able to develop applications, mobile applications specifically, uh, that consumed Creative Cloud services. The Photoshop Mix application you saw, that was an Adobe-built application. But the same capabilities that Adobe now has in their applications are available to third parties which is through the Creative SDK. So they can build and manipulate images as well. Uh, so we started with that launch in June of 2014, and we've had several significant events along the way. Uh, actually, and now sort of tailing out where you can sort of see now where we are in September from where we started about, I think it was five or 10 million API requests a month uh, in that June of 2014 day till I am confident now looking at our current numbers, the September date was as of last Friday. We will cross the four billion API threshold mark uh, this month for the first time. So we've had a lot of adoption. And that's come from both increased usage of the, from those very first initial APIs, as well as onboarding of uh, new API services that are being available, to, are available now to customers and they're starting to consume. So it's being driven by two things. On the, char the, other, the second chart about the daily API request volume, you can see that the peak and the averages are actually following in the same trend, always up and to the right. So we had, uh, during this month, we actually had our highest daily peak volume of about 310 million API requests in a day, which I think, I can't remember the exact number, it's like about 3,000 requests per second or something if you averaged it out over the entire day. Of course, we all know that, that it looks much more spikier than that. But, so it's continually going up and to the right, uh, which matches, again, what we've expected. And we've been able to do all of that while, kind of de while delivering a four nines kind of uptime across the, the gateway services itself. So customers now, they look at us as, we're just always there. I like to call it as API dial tone. We're just always there. So they expect us to always be there. And the one observation I would like to have, I'd like to kind of share with the crowd, is that you know, Nginx has been the, we made that decision two years ago uh, about what to use as the core technology in the gateway from a web server perspective. And during that time, for this last 15 months in production, Nginx is, we've never had an issue with it. It's always been a reliable, scalable, and high-performing technology that we use at the core of the gateway, so we're really happy with that decision uh, to use that. So here's my favorite slide, my architecture slide. So these are a really high-level building block diagram. What you're gonna see, I just wanna point out a couple of things. Again, we, we talked about the four big capability areas, security, management, analytics, and enablement. I haven't really talked a lot about the management layer. So, uh, API key management, the dynamic throttling or dynamic uh, traffic routing, and throttling and rate limiting. So this was actually uh, two, of the, one, two of the areas here, or this, sorry, two features in this area here where we really started working on a lot this year. So with throttling and rate limiting, I, I just want to make to, to talk about is in terms of throttling, I talk about velocity. How many requests are we getting per second? Whereas rate limiting, I talk about a volume. How many requests over a longer period of time, a day or a month? Because we use those terms interchangeably, but we've tried to be very uh, consistent about how we use them. So we also, what we also needed to be able to do was we said that we can't just do things anymore at an individual node layer. We have to be able to do things across multiple Nginx nodes and share a throttle or a rate limit across multiple nodes. And, and when you're in Amazon, of course, you have a highly elastic uh, compute platform, so you want to be able to auto-scale those up and down. So the idea that we thought about just simply averaging out, if you said 10,000 requests per second and then trying to time slice all of those across a number of nodes, really became something that was kind of hard for us to keep track of and wasn't really offering 
value to the back ends. So we wrote what we called and released uh, the first half of this year, the gateway tracking service. So this is uh, basically a, a layer now that sits on top of the gateway that communicates with all the gateway nodes themselves and basically tells the gateways when to enforce a particular policy and when, and when they can back off a particular policy based on the throttle or the rate limit. So this requires that the nodes basically communicate traffic, uses traffic as they go to the, to the tracking, the G, to GTS. GTS has a, a plan that it's following to say, not only, not only now do we add by service, but we can also say at a much more granular level, by service, by application, or even by user. So you can now set a, a throttle or a rate limit to say a given user or a given application can only consume so much over a period of time, either as a throttle or a rate limit. So this helps not only protect the service, but makes from, uh, from just being attacked, per se, or overconsumed, but a service being overconsumed by a particular individual or application, which is something else we want to look at when we're trying to sh uh, share the same service across many, many users. Um, so on the security side, again, we talked about the different types of validations we can do, and the key point here was the gateway does validations. It doesn't do the actual authorizations natively in the gateway. Maybe we could extend those out to a microservice outside of the gateway, but what we wanted to do was actually keep the gateway as lean and mean as possible. So it tries to make its decisions, yes or no, and then move it along. So we tried to avoid doing a lot of business logic there. We talked a little bit about analytics, and on the enablement side, uh, again, we're all about self-service. We're, we're on a journey to try and both enable publishers to be able to self-service their own API needs, but also cons our third-party developers and enterprises that can come and find and service their own needs from an analytics perspective, or from a, sorry, an API consumption perspective. So what's next? So we're looking to do our next upgrade to OpenREST, the Nginx 1931, later this year. Continue with API service onboarding. Anomaly detection. And also, I think, uh, for those of you maybe who are at ContainerCon, what you may realize or have seen is that we are now starting to open source components of our platform. And you will see this continue to grow over the next coming months. But right now, we have open sourced uh, the actual gateway itself. Uh, and it's available both in terms of the actual code, but also as a Docker container for those of you who love Docker containers. That's actually a good lead into uh, a session later this afternoon where one of my colleagues, Dragos, who I see over here right in the middle, is actually going to be talking about some of our, exper uh, our experimentation that we're doing with Docker and Mesos, not only from microservices behind the gateway, but by the, for the gateway itself. So I think with that, I'd like to wrap it up, and thank you for your time and attention this morning. I appreciate it.